All right. Good morning. Y'all ready to learn a little bit this morning? I am too. I think it's going to be a fun morning. I hope I learned something. I hope I remember what I was supposed to remember, and we'll figure it out, all right? We are in our first week of our series entitled uh, Table Conversations. So I want to let you know up front, this is going to be kind of an introduction to this series, and also to let you know that this gearing of the table conversations, we're going to be focusing and gearing the majority of the material toward families, toward families with children at home, uh, toward families that are trying to make it through life, toward you families who barely got to church this morning because somehow, some way, one of your kids managed to get into the car with only one shoe. Um, so this series is focused toward uh, these families particularly, but the principles that are going to be taught can apply across the board, whether you've got young children at home, if you're like myself and I have grandchildren, if you uh, don't have any children, you're not married, these kind of conversations can continue and happen in the workplace environment, in your school environment, at a coffee shop, whatever it may be, wherever there's relationship, conversations can take place. So this morning, as we dig into this idea of table conversations, of course, I've got a table up here, and I can just imagine there were, um, I have two children, my wife and I and two children, and as we were growing up, um, our table was a little bit bigger. Um, We grew up in a home where we did our very, very best to have meals around the table. How many of y'all have meals around your tables? You you shoot for that, right? A lot of times, it's the McDonald's table, or it's the, the, the lap in the car, but you try your best to have meals around the table, because the reality is, the table is where some of the very best conversations that can ever happen within your home take place. And I want to encourage you as we dig into this series to make this a priority. But for some of us, it's not a, it's not a physical table. I remember when my children were little, there were different places that we could have conversations. Um, I have a a 29-year-old son and a 25-year-old daughter. Um, My daughter was easier for me to raise. Me, I'm not talking about wife, I'm talking about me. The reason she was easier for me to raise is because she fought me all the time. To this day, I don't think she's ever admitted that I've been right about anything. And that's good. I like that. I don't know if you know this about me, but I do like to fight. So for my daughter to push back and shove back, she was a little bit easy for me because we would fight and we would work through things and, and we would get to a, a end rewards and things that were done. It was just easy conversations. My son, on the other hand, was a little bit more difficult because he would not fight. <laughs> See, my son would do this. He would say, Dad, you're right. And then he'd go do whatever the heck he wanted to do. But he would just tell me I was right because he didn't want to fight. He didn't want to get in the situation. So for me, as, as my kids begin to grow and I begin to say, how do I have the kind of conversations that are going to have meaning, that are going to be things that, that this son of mine that I'm speaking of now has two boys of his own. And what is being passed on and how are these legacies continuing? Well, a lot of it happens around these kinds of tables. Or around the table of your car ride to school. Or wherever you go to get ice cream or whatever it may be. I remember for my son, one of the things when he hit about 13 years old. How many of y'all have teenagers in your home? You have teenagers in your home right here? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Somewhere along the way, and I've always believed this, when a kid hits about 13, their brain begins to ooze out of their ears. Have y'all noticed that? Now, if you're a good parent, you try to collect it in a mason jar so that when we hit about 23 or 24, you can pour it back in because they're going to need that. But about 13, it just oozes out. All of a sudden, as a parent, you become the dumbest person in the entire world. Y'all know that? Have you experienced it? And your kids somehow got ridiculously smart because they can Google something, all right? So I know for my son, when I hit about there, how are we going to connect? What kind of conversations are we going to have? And I sought for those. It wasn't always around a table, a physical table. But we set a table wherever we could because I wanted to be able to connect with him and with my daughter. We wanted to be able to create a legacy for the future. So I'm gonna gonna share with you this morning. Again, it's kind of an introductory to the message. I'm gonna share some New Testament principles. We're gonna use our Bibles. Gonna share some New Testament principles and then some things that have lived from the beginning of time that was written all the way back in the Old Testament thousands of years ago, which is still consistent in today of how to do this and how to have these conversations. But I wanna share with you something. So in front of you, there are these magnets with a a QR code, and you can scan that and go to our website. It'll take you right to sermon notes. You can look up here on the screen, and you can see some of the things that I'm going to share this morning. But I want to give you a statement about these tables. They're going to put it up on the screen for me, and it's this. Your table, 
I don't care where you're, it could be a physical table. It could be a dinner table. It could be the table riding in the car. It could be the place, wherever you identify the place that the conversations need to happen. Your table, it has to be a judgment-free space. So, I, now, now listen, I, I get it if you've got small children, you do need to find that other shoe, okay? We do need to get their attention. We do, I'm not talking about not disciplining your children and guiding your children and helping them do things. What I'm saying is this place, this place of conversation needs to be a place where your children feel safe. It needs to be a judgment-free space that you've created where your kid can say, will y'all say that last word? anything. I can't tell you the number of families. I've been doing pastoral counseling and coaching for over 30 years, and I can't tell you the number of families that will come in, and and they haven't had the conversations with their children, whether it be about sex or drugs or or relationships or peer pressure or whatever it may be, Um, all the different subjects. They haven't had them, and then they bring them into the pastor's office, and they're like, hey, will you fix my kid? And, And if I was telling the truth, I would go, no, you blew it. You should have done it when they were little. But I don't do that because I'm a loving, caring pastor. All right? But I do think it. Just to go, all right, anyway, all right. So the conversations need to be around the table, wherever you create that table. Again, driving your kids to school, sitting at McDonald's, uh, sitting around the dinner table. Create the judgment-free places where your kids can say anything. If you want to take this and apply it outside of your family, have you created the kind of environments around you that people are allowed to disagree with you and be in conversation? See, you will never gain influence with anyone until you can sit across from the table with someone and let them know that you care more about them than you do about your own rights and your own opinions. Will you all agree with that? You should because Jesus said it, okay? So it's true. So create the environment because conversations are hard. I mean, having to say what we mean, meaning what we say, saying in a way that makes sense. Have you ever tried to communicate with a 13-year-old boy? In today's world, you get, bruh, (laughs) right? It's hard. But just because the conversations are hard, it doesn't mean we should give up hope. So I want to share with you a little bit. It it, it takes this. It takes love. Um, your, Your table, the place that you have the conversation, should be a place without judgment and a place with love. Because I don't, I don't know if you know this or not. But you can do everything right. Hear me. You can read the right verses. Your kids can say a prayer when they're young to accept Jesus. Your kids can follow in whatever it may be. You can do everything right. But there's going to come a day that your children are going to make their own decisions. There's going to come a day that they may not make a decision to follow Jesus. But you've got to create the environment where the conversation can happen. So one of the things I've learned over the years in trying to teach about families and teach about marriage and things is, I don't know if you know this or not, if you're a Bible person, when you say, hey, I want to have a biblical family or I want to have a biblical marriage, did you know there's not really any good representations in the Bible? Did y'all know that? I mean, you try to go through your Bible and you're like, Adam and Eve had a really good marriage. Yeah, except for the whole snake talking, eating the, eating the fruit thing, right? All right, let's throw them out. Abraham and Sarah, well, that was a good marriage. Yeah, except they didn't trust God. And Sarah said, here, have my handmaid and get her pregnant and have babies by her. Huh, that doesn't work in today's marriage. Who are we going to trust? Oh, Solomon, because he wrote the Song of Solomon about love. That's fantastic. We should, we should mirror Solomon, except he had 700 wives. <laughs> Guys, that's 700 mothers-in-law. But anyway, as you walk through that, it's, there's just no good examples in the Bible of what a, a family who did it right. It's kind of weird. But yet there's principles. So Paul, uh, one of the writers, wrote the majority of the New Testament. He actually gives us some principles in a letter that he wrote to a church in Ephesus. And these are principles that can follow from the time he wrote them all the way to today. And it gives us the idea of what the family is supposed to look like. Because if you're going to have these kind of conversations, it has to be a place that allows the family to love, allows the family to have the hard conversations and to walk through the things that are difficult. So I want you to follow along. And if 
Ephesians chapter 5. Again, they'll put it up on the screen for me. Um, when I was growing up in church, I grew up in a, a very legalistic kind of environment. Legalism means that they just taught you the rules and told you to check the boxes, and then you could earn God's love. I didn't say that, but it was the way it was taught to me. So this idea of submit, everybody say the word submit. Say it like you mean it. Okay, submit was taught to me when I was younger that it is a wife's responsibility to submit to her husband, which we're going to read here in a second, that there's an illustration that a wife should submit to her husband. But the word submit was taught to me like this. Women, you should submit. How many of you women want to hear that? You could rip that whip out of his hand and beat the living snot out of him pretty quickly, can't you? That's right. And if you, yeah, anyway, I'll leave that alone, all right? But the idea is this. So before the verse on wives submit to your husbands, Paul actually writes these words that are on the screen. He says this. He said, submit to one another. That means a husband submits to his wife and a wife submits to her husband and the children submit to their parents and the parents also submit to the children. You're going, wait a minute, I ain't submitting to nothing. If I submit to my kid, we're having Cocoa Puffs at every meal and Reese's before we go to bed and we're going to wash it down with red Kool-Aid. No, that's not what I'm talking about. You do know better. You are the parent. The idea of submit is the idea of setting myself aside and caring about another person over my own wants. So Paul lays some groundwork and he says, submit to one another. Then he gives the illustration. The illustration he gives of a wife. He says it this way in verse 22. He says, wives, submit yourselves to your own Husbands, as you do to the Lord, because anything that you're doing as an act of love is an act to God or to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Now, a lot of people will look at this and say, well, God created man. He's supposed to be the head of the home. He's the one in charge, and whatever the man says, the woman should do. Yeah, that's not exactly what it means. I don't know if you know this or not, but God created a woman out of a man's side, out of a rib, out of his side. He did not create a woman out of his head so that she could lord over him. He did not create a woman out of a foot bone so that he could step on top of her. He created a woman out of his side so that he could put his arm around her and love her and nurture her and care for her and her in turn do the same for him. So this idea of submitting to your husband is not you bowing down on the floor and doing everything that the man says. It is a mutual submission. And if a man is living the way that God wants him to live, he's worth following. So man, I'm picking on you, okay? For a wife to submit to her husband, the hand, husband needs to be who he needs to be. For the husband is the head of the wife. Remember, God created this order. Sometimes I look back and I'm not God. I don't know if y'all know that or not. If I was God, I would have done this different. I would have made the women to be in charge over everything. Because the reality is, guys, whether we want to admit it to or not, if you are married, your wife is smarter than you. Will the men say amen? Will the woman agree with my statement? Thank you. <laughs> You're like, yeah, that dude can't even fold his own underwear. I got it, all right? Now, the reality is, God created us, and God made us responsible as men and as husbands in our homes. But when we're leading correctly, it makes these conversations. And by the way, your children are watching. Mom, your children are watching how you respond. Dad, your children are watching how you treat and how you respond. But God created this order, and God said, men, you're going to be responsible. When we stand before God, those of us that are married, we're going to give an account for our home and for our family. And we're the one that are going to be held to account for that. Verse 24, now as the church submits to Christ, also wives should submit to their husbands. So again, Paul is painting a picture and he's saying, this is what this looks like. The church, we as a church, we submit to the authority of Christ. And that's a picture of a wife submitting to her husband. But then Paul goes this, look what he says in verse 25. He says, husbands, love your wives. Now this idea of love is also submission. It's loving your wife. You go, wait a minute, he says love and she says submit. And we've always had the rules and the, and the roles that if we submit to God and the God the husband submits to God and the wife submits to the husband. Everything will be great. No, we're all submitting to God. And when, when Paul says, husbands love your wives, it is an act of submission. You want me to show you how? Look at this at the end of verse 25. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, the church. What did Christ do for the church? Y'all help me out, class. What did Christ do for the church? He died. Now, I can't tell you the number of husbands over the years, the number of times that I've done marriage counseling, and I've looked at guys, whether it's pre-marriage counseling or marriage counseling while they're walking through stuff, and I've said to them, do you understand that Christ was not willing to die for the church? Christ died for the church. 
as a husband, when you step into this role, and then if God gives you the privilege of being a father one day, what you are doing is you are saying, I am dying to my own desires. I am dying to my own wants. It is now my responsibility before God to love this lady, to love these children, and to treat them as God's gifts is what they are. Do you all agree with that? You should, because the Bible says it, all right? So when Paul says, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church, that's an act of submission. Christ loved the, loved the church so much that he died for it. He set aside his own for it. Paul continues to go on. Let me read this through this pretty quickly. He says about Christ loving the church, to make the church holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle. Because of his sacrifice, the church can be with him one day. Verse 28, in the same ways, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. So we are members of his body. And then Paul uses something that it was actually quoted by God the Father in the Garden of Eden to Adam and Eve before there were fathers and mothers. He said this, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Listen, if you're going to have the kind of family table conversations wherever they may be, listen to me, men. I want you to hear me say this. Don't you ever ever be in a situation where you say, Well, if you just did it like my mama did, everything will be okay. Did y'all hear that grunt that went across the room? Did you hear the clicking? That was women pulling their knives out, just in case you're wondering, all right? Don't you ever do that? It's about the most insulting thing you could possibly do. Because at the moment that you get married, men, we step away from our family of origin and we give our lives to our wife and we go into their family of origin and we love them. I don't care if your mama made the best biscuits and gravy in the whole world and your wife, the first time she attempted gravy, it was like plaster of Paris and you could have casted a foot with it. You eat it and you chew and you cut it up and then maybe you learn how to make gravy and you serve your wife with your gravy. How does that sound? That's how you love. You leave them. Verse 32, you leave your mother and father, not your wife. Verse 32, this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. That's that love. That's his submission. Well, when Paul was writing this letter, there weren't chapters and verses. So it's not like he finished a thought at the end of chapter 5. He continued it on. And chapter 6 now brings the whole family into account. Chapter 6, verse 1 says these words. It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And then he says this. He says, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy life on this earth. So he's including this idea. So hear me. He's including the idea of mutual love, mutual submission with husband, with wife, with children, because it's love that matters more than anything else. He goes on in verse 4 and says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Now, I've got, um, I've got the spiritual gift of sarcasm. I don't know if you all know that about me or not. It is a spiritual gift. The Holy Spirit put it in. No, it's not. It's actually sin when it's out of control, all right? But I used to think this verse does not pertain to me. It is my responsibility to pick on my children. Any fathers that do that in the room, don't raise your hands. Wives, don't you elbow him in the cheek, all right? The reality is when he says, fathers, do not exasperate your children, he's actually going to a, a, a statement. And here's the statement. Don't exasperate them. Don't put them in places where the table, the conversations, the things in your marriage and in your home become places of contention. Now hear me, we don't live in a perfect world. Children make mistakes, parents make mistakes. We don't have this all figured out. I've told my children a thousand times, the moment that they were delivered and we got ready to leave the hospital, nobody handed us a how-to book. There were no instructions. There was a lot of assembly required, but there were no instructions when they handed us these little pooping babies to take home afterwards. So the idea is this, in loving and caring for each other, it's don't push them to a point. Learn their personalities. Learn who God created them to be. Recognize their strengths. Recognize their weaknesses. Recognize the things in their life where you're probably going to have a child that needs a little bit of a hug. You're probably going to have a child that needs a little bit of a, a kick in the tail every once in a while. You're probably going to have a child that, that needs words of encouragement. You're probably going to have a child that needs to just be in your presence. It's probably going to be the case. So Paul says, don't exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up. That means figure them out. 
Your children should be a case study. Every single time you have the opportunity for the conversation, no matter where it is, it should be you bringing your children up. You need to raise your children to release them. You do not need a 30-year-old child living in your basement playing Nintendo. You need to release your children into the world. You need to point them to Jesus and let them be who God created them to be. And where does it all happen? It happens around the tables. As we dig into this series in the weeks to come, you're going to hear some really, really practical ways to have these kind of conversations, some really, really good ideas and examples and techniques and things that you can do. So if you have small children at home, come, encourage your neighbors, encourage friends and say, how do we do If you've got teenagers, it's not too late. If you're a grandparent like me, I'm going to continue learning and continue pouring into these kids and the next generation and the next generation and continue doing this. Moses actually wrote about this. You know who Moses is. He's the Old Testament guy. He's the guy that God called to go to Egypt and release his people. Moses led the children of Israel for 40 years in the desert. Because of his own sin and his own mistakes, he wasn't allowed to enter the promised land. Instead, Joshua did. But before he died, he spoke these words to the nation about how to raise their families. I said a few minutes ago that um, I grew up with, my parents were good parents. Don't ever hear me bashing my parents. We just, they learned Christianity kind of legalistically, that if you check the boxes, everything's good. So there was something interesting, like, um, you may not know this about me, but I am the youngest in my family. I have two older brothers. Um, How many of you are the youngest children in your home? Will you raise your hands up? Raise your hands up really high. So if you're the youngest in your home, you fully recognize that your parents kept attempting to get it right. And when they finally created the perfect child, they stopped after that one. So all of us youngest children, we do understand that about ourselves, right? We do, right? Okay. Anyway. So as the youngest, I got to watch both of my brothers make stupid mistakes. And I just either learned from them or learned how to manipulate my way through things. Well, anytime a guest preacher would come to our church and he would preach about family stuff, he would always talk about having family devotions. Family devotions are when your family sits down and they open the Bible and you read together as a family and you pray together and you sing songs out of the red hymn book and everybody says kumbaya and you love each other and there's no fighting and arguments because that's what happens when you read the Bible, right? All right, anyway, um, so that's what my dad was taught. So it was always interesting whenever family night came in the revival services, I knew this as a little kid that here we go again. My dad is going to hear the revival preacher talking about doing family devotions. You know what that means? That means that for the next two weeks, we're going to have family devotions around the table instead of dessert after we eat every night. Now, as a fully intellectual, smart aleck, youngest child, I would try to figure out how quickly I could get my dad mad so we could quit doing family devotions. Because Gilligan's Island was usually on right after we ate. And that was important. Usually daddy would make it, I don't know, four or five days. Sometimes one. Sometimes he was like, let's read the Bible. Shut up! Whatever. I mean, it was whatever. Um, So before Missy and I were even blessed with kids, and then after our son was born, we kind of had this mindset of this. Um, We're not just going to make it about one event. We're going to make our entire family about teaching our children. And we got the idea. It wasn't ours. I got the idea from Moses. He's a pretty smart dude. Look at his words in Deuteronomy 6. He said these words. He said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. He's uh, quoting one of the commands that we honor God and love God. Then he says this. He says, Love the Lord your God with all your hearts, with all your soul, and with all your strength. I don't know if you remember this, but Jesus used those same words in the New Testament. Only he added to them, the greatest commands are to love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, who's closest neighbors than your own family? Um, Moses goes on, says, Love the Lord your God. In verse 6, he says, These commandments that I give you today are to be on your heart. It means that it should be at the seat of your emotions and that everything that you do is to love the Lord your God. And then he says something really, really cool. And hopefully this will be something that you grab a hold of and go, I can do this. It's not too late. I can do this both in my family environment, around a table, in a car ride. I can do this in my work. I can do this anywhere. And he says this. He says, impress them on your children. I love these words. Talk. Talk about them when you sit. When you sit at home, talk about them. And I'm going to add the talk, all right? Talk about them when you sit at home. 
Talk about them when you walk along the road or when we drive along the road. Talk about them when you lie down and talk about them when you get up. That means that every situation that you're in as a family is a table conversation. But it's your responsibility to create that. We're the grown-ups. We're the ones that get to do this kind of stuff. Create the environments that as you talk, as you walk. I love that Moses in writing this talked about when you go to bed and when you wake up. That means some of you are allowed to be nighttime people. And some of you, like me, are morning people. How many morning people do we have in the room? All right, there were 17 other people that went on a mission trip with me two weeks ago. Um, How many of y'all know that I'm a morning person now? All right, because every morning when it was time to get up, I chose the song of the day. And I love the Tarzan movie. So it was usually tearing up the camp or something from U2 or maybe a little Aerosmith or there was a little Jesus in there. But anyway, it was just good. I just want to wake people up and get them excited. I got the coffee pot plugged in. I'd already been up for a couple hours, so I didn't get it. But then I had some people on the trip that are nighttime people and they had to figure out not to strangle me while I slept. So it was all of this together. We all have these own personalities, and it's okay if you're a night person, if you're a morning person. Moses says, talk about it all the time, no matter where you are. This environment right here, the table conversations, they can be had anytime. But it's got to be judgment-free. It's got to be a place where the conversations could happen. So understand this. We're talking predominantly about the family, but just for a second... What does is, what is your work table look like? Do you have people in your work environment who disagree with you or that you disagree with? Maybe you disagree with them politically. Oh, it's that time of year again. <laughs> Maybe you disagree with them about sexual orientation. Maybe you disagree with them about race or color or whatever it may be, whatever the thoughts may be. Have you created an environment around you that allows you to share the love of Jesus? Let me tell you what it takes. This conversation looks like something. What does the conversation look like? It looks like this. It looks like love. See, the greatest command that God gave us was to love God and to love our neighbors. And it looks like love. Real practically, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, Paul writes about this kind of a conversation. And he says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. How many have already had unwholesome talk? Don't raise your hands. Come out of your mouths on the way to church this morning trying to get your kids checked in because we are a tagging church. Tagging church means we tag the children in the wild. We put stickers on their back in case they run and we know how to get them back. So we tag our children here at our church. We make sure that you know where they are and you got to have the special tag to pick up your child when you come back. Because if you don't have that tag, we're not giving you your child. We turn them completely into slave labor Monday through Friday. But you got to have the tag. But some of you have children that when you try to put the tag on their back, they're used to coming to church here. And you go to reach and they do this. Don't do it. And they move around and they don't want to be tagged. They don't want to put their shoes on. Or if you're like my kids, that little thing at the beginning of your socks where they sew the lip over on the sock, that little piece of thread, my son would lose his ever-loving mind if that piece of thread didn't line up right on top of his toes. Y'all got kids like that? You do, don't you? Yeah. Every one of us does. And what happens? What do we typically try to do? For the love of everything holy, put your shoes on. Be grateful you have shoes. You don't need socks. Just get out of the house and ride the bus. Doesn't work that way. If it's done in love, Paul says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. But only what's helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Boy, there's something tough in there with whom you were sealed on the day of redemption. He says, get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and brawling and slander. Those ideas are the ideas that if your kid does something wrong, you don't put it on a chalkboard and say, that's strike one, that's strike two, that's strike three. I'm no longer going to treat you this way. I'm no longer going to do it. No, I'm not talking about discipline. I'm not talking about helping your kids grow up. I'm talking about you don't hold things against them. You don't hold things against other people. Get rid of all of it. Be kind, compassionate. Verse 32, to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. And then in chapter 5, Paul says these words. He says, be imitators of God. God was the one who forgave. God was the one who loved. Therefore, as dearly loved children and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice 
to God. So I'm going to be really, really quick as I wrap up the rest of this message. What does love look like? What does love look like in these conversations that you're going to have around the table, whether it be in your home, in your car, maybe at work with those people, but predominantly in your family, what does it look like? Here's the first thing. Love gives up my rights. See, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very proud to have been born in America. I know we're not perfect, and we get less and less perfecter as the days go on, but I, I am grateful to live here. I've been to other places around the world. I've seen the way that they have to live and what's going on there. I've seen that they don't have particular rights to do things. But at any point that my rights as a U.S. citizen come contrary to what Jesus wants of me, it is my job to set apart my patriotism and to act the way Jesus wants me to act. That means that love gives up my rights. What does that look like in a family environment? I'm dad. I get to make stupid statements like, if you don't stop crying, I'm going to give you something to cry about. That's the dumbest statement ever created in the entire world. One time, as the youngest smart aleck child, I responded to my mom with, you know, I have to give you something to cry about, I'm already crying. And she slapped me across the table. And I realized, that's mom being mom, I should shut up. Give up your rights. Love your kids. Have the conversations. Point them. Raise them to release them. The brother of Jesus wrote these words about our rights. He says this. He says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. You go, well, that's what my kids do all the time. They learned it from you. You kill, you covet, you cannot have what you... You cannot have what you want, so you quarrel and you fight. You do not have because you don't ask God. You're not trusting him. When you ask, you don't receive because you ask for the wrong motives. It's all about me, God, that you may spend what you get on your own pleasure. So James kind of reminds us to give up our rights. And then the second way that love looks is love gives up myself. I shared a little bit of this earlier, and I'll just tag that scripture along with it and let you understand that love says, you get me. I could lie to you and tell you that we did everything right in raising our children, but we didn't. <laughs> By the grace of God, um, number one, our kids are alive. <laughs> um, we figured out how to feed them. Um, and number two, our, our kids are healthy and they're following Jesus. And that's only the grace of God. You can do everything right and it may not turn out that way. But as a parent, we're giving ourselves to our children. And love has the conversations, the hard conversations, the conversations that say, tell me what you're feeling. Tell me what you're walking through. The conversations that just a couple of weeks ago in our community, we had uh, an event called Light the Night that was because of the, uh, the ideation of suicide and so many uh, students in our area around Western North Carolina that have taken their own lives in suicide. There was a group of people in Faith Connect that I get to be a part of that just said, we got to stop. We got to be a part of this. And we brought in a special speaker and we met over at Blue Ridge College a couple of Monday nights ago. It was 1,300 some odd students from our community that were there. And as I was sitting in there listening and I was listening to them talk and being a part of praying for this and putting it all together and the training that went into this, the recognition that that conversation needs to happen. The recognition that our kids are carrying more. I need you to hear me, parents. Hear me, grandparents. I made a joke about Gilligan's Island. We got our first color TV when I was 14, and I was the remote control. <laughs> click, click. I mean, we only had three channels. It wasn't hard. But if you have kids or grandkids in today's world, you have no idea what they're going through. You don't. I don't. You have no idea that... For us, some of us, when we were younger, when we went to school, if you got bullied, home was an escape. But these, our kids today, <laughs> they carry it with them everywhere they go. So if they get bullied at school and they get bullied somewhere else, and I don't know why I'm sharing this because I didn't in the first service, so I'm just going to trust the Holy Spirit. Online, it just continues. 
And kids sit in conversations and they have some of the hardest things they have to think through and they have to process through. And if you don't, I'll get emotional, if you don't create this environment in your home to have these table conversations, you're not giving your kid yourself. You're not loving them. So let, let me wrap up, all right? I got two questions. I'd, if you haven't listened to anything I've said, if you haven't taken any notes or you've been, been online, I would encourage you. I'm gonna put two questions on the screen. Take a picture of them. Go to the sermon notes, whatever it may be. These are the questions to ask if you're wondering what love looks like. Love asks these questions before speaking. Before doing anything, this is what love asks. Number one is this, what can I do to help? What can I do to help? No matter where your children are, no matter what they're walking through, no matter where your spouse is, your future spouse, wherever you may be, the people that you work with, if you approach with the attitude and with the love in your heart that says, how can I help? What can I do to help? That is an act of love. That is you giving up your rights and giving up yourself. That is what love looks like. And then the second question is this. Not only what can I do to help, what does love require of me in this situation? Oh, if I could go back. I wish I could go back to the times that I was angry with my kids. Oh, I, I did my best to ask them to forgive me. I did my best to walk through stuff. But I imprinted on their personalities. I imprinted on their emotions. And I wish I could go back. What I'll do now is not live in regret. And I'll have the conversations with them. And I'll watch my kids as they raise their kids. And see what God does. What does love require of me in this situation? Sometimes, uh, if your kid is walking out in the road and there's cars coming, you're probably not going to get their attention by going, Hey, Johnny, look out for the car. Probably won't work. And on the other hand, don't be the parent that goes, Well, if he gets hit once, he won't do it again. Don't be that parent either, all right? You might have to raise your voice. So what does love require of me in every situation, in every conversation, in every place that I am? So let me close with this idea and then I'm done. See, we, we talk about every week, we talk about Jesus and his love for us. So for some reason, I imagine this conversation this morning, and it's completely imagined, all right? Don't feel like I'm trying to teach you some the theological truth and what I'm getting ready to tell you. It was completely imagined for me around these two questions. But I was just kind of imagining this morning. And I thought, you know what? There was a day, thousands of years ago, where God, I mean, boy, where did it come from? Where did God begin? Well, that's a crazy one that'll take up too much time. Somewhere along the way, God said, I want community. I, I want community with something I've created. And he created a man. And then he created a woman out of that man. And he put him in the very perfect, the most perfect environment they could possibly be in. God put man and woman in that perfect environment, but he also gave them the ability to choose. And he knew this wasn't God going, roll the dice, if it doesn't work, we'll come up with a backup plan. God knew, even in creation, that man in his own free will and of his own choice would make a decision to not follow him. But I just imagined this morning as I was thinking that when Adam and Eve stood there and they took the fruit, and God knew, God knew they, they can't be in perfect community. They have to be separated. And he sent them out of the Garden of Eden. Just an imagined conversation on my part. I wonder if Jesus looked over to his father and he said, Hey, Dad, what can I do to help? This isn't the way you created it. There wasn't supposed to be sin. There wasn't supposed to be separation. There wasn't supposed to be pain. There wasn't supposed to be thorns on roses. It was supposed to be perfect. What can I do to help? And as I was imagining the conversation this morning, I began to imagine the Father, God our Father, going, oh, son, oh, you don't know what you're asking. You have no idea what it's going to take for you to help. And as the Father turned to his son, Jesus, and said, again, all my imagination, turned to his son Jesus and he said, it's going to require your life. I'm going to need you to leave the perfection of heaven because man cannot save himself. Man is a sinner separated from me and there is no way to restore this community without sacrifice. So this is what I'm going to need you to do. Thank you for asking what you can do to help. 
I'm going to need you to leave the perfection of heaven. I'm going to need you to take on a bodily form. I'm going to need you to become a baby and, and go into the womb and cry and, and, and be born. I'm going, to need you to, I'm going to need you to live a life that you're going to be tempted in. You're going to be my perfect son, but you will be tempted in everything so that you can identify, so that you can be the perfect sacrifice. I'm going to need you to live a sinless life, not give in to one temptation. And for some reason, I just imagine Jesus saying, so, Pops, Father, what is this love going to require of me? And God the Father said, oh, it's going to require everything. See, the only way that families can ever have the opportunity to have the kind of union that I've created and the right relationship with me is it's going to require you to give your life. And it's not going to be a pretty ending. And Jesus said, I'm going to give up my rights and I'm going to give of myself. And that's the picture of what a family is supposed to look like. If you don't know Jesus this morning, I want you to recognize that he did give his life for you. That today, maybe one of the reasons that this is such a hard discussion for you and it's not working is because you're not leading toward Jesus because you've never met him. Will you accept him this morning? Accepting Jesus is as simple as admitting that you're a sinner. Oh, it wasn't simple on his part. He had to give his life. It's as simple as admitting you're a sinner, believing that he's the son of God, asking him to forgive you and asking him to change your life and following him. That's the place to begin the conversations. So I would ask you this morning, if you don't know Jesus, accept him. If you are a Christian, find yourself somewhere in this. And, and maybe, maybe you're not in the family place of your life anymore. Maybe that's a different dynamic for you. But where can the conversations happen? And then there's some of you here this morning that this is a real thing. You're trying to raise children. You're trying to raise teenagers. You're trying to figure this out. I would tell you, start with love. Start with love first. Start with these questions and see what God can do. Let me pray. God, I love you this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth. God, I pray that we are able to apply this to our lives and use it. Thank you for your sacrifice and for what you did for us. God, may we live lives that honor you. And if there's anybody here today that doesn't know you, God, I pray that they'll come talk to me at the end of this. Not be embarrassed, not be uh, nervous, but just come talk to me or step back to that next step desk in the back of the auditorium and just say, hey, I, I need to know more about accepting Jesus and talk to somebody there. Um, God, and then for the families that are in here this morning that um, they're sitting in these challenges, and some of them feel like it's too late, but it's not. God, I pray that the conversations that happen around tables this week, wherever that table may be, I pray that they point people to you, and they're acted out, and they're lived out in love. Thank you. It's in your name we pray.